Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am Carrie the Mortician. Welcome to my channel if you've not been here before. So this is a live video where I will answer questions. Um, today's is a little different. I had two students have an assignment where they had to ask a funeral director or mortician some questions. So I'm going to answer their questions first and kind of blow through them because they're really vague, weird questions. I don't know who these teachers are that come up with these questions, but they're a little wacky. So I'm going to blow through those first, and then we'll start answering questions from you as you throw them at me um, in the live chat. So here we go. What accomplishments were important to articulate in your last interview that I did at a funeral home? I don't know the last time I really interviewed. Um, I think my freelancing and being able to really cover any area of the funeral home is a huge part of my skill set that I like to kind of let shine, I guess, um, because I've done really every job within the funeral home at some point or another over the course of my career. What are the most important skills you've acquired through your experience? I would say just the ability to really talk from to anybody um, about anything and try and carry on a conversation for it. I could probably talk to about anybody and carry on a le legit, decent conversation for a good solid 10, 15 minutes about anything. I think that's a skill that you pick up along the way, being able to talk to people. What are a few things you're looking for when hiring someone who works for you? So how do they present themselves when they come to an interview with me? Um, how do they speak? How do they carry themselves? How do they interact with other people around the funeral home when they do a tour? How professional are they dressed? And do they interact with everyone? So that to me is, it says it all. The non-question answer items of what I observe of a person is more important to me than the questions. Anybody can answer anything in a very great way, but it's how someone carries themselves and presents themselves. You cannot change. If someone comes in with their cell phone and their cell phone goes off and they touch their cell phone when they are interacting with me in an interview, I will never hire them honestly, because that's completely unprofessional. So there's little things that if somebody does, if you send me a resume and it's got any typos on it, I won't, call, I won't even consider you. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty rough when it comes to all that stuff. Happy Easter, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Good to see you guys. I'm answering some questions for some students quickly, and then I'll get to your questions. So um, hold them until I say go. Okay. How important were internships in your career path? It, it, huge. You learn most of this hands-on. You can't learn how to deal with people from a book. You can't learn how to embalm from a book, really. You can't learn how to do a lot of things from a book when it comes to this profession. What things should I consider when accepting my first job? Well, I always tell students and apprentices and funeral directors that are in my student group, you are interviewing them and whether they are a good fit for you. Do not just put yourself out as if you're desperate for any job. There are so many funeral jobs, so many apprenticeships, so many positions that are open right now. There are hundreds. So you are interviewing them to see if it's a good fit for you. Ask them the hours. Ask them the wages. Ask them the dress code. These are their things. You're not changing them. So don't expect when you hire on, it's going to change for you. No, it's their business. You follow their rules, their schedule, their dress code. So if you have earrings everywhere and they hire you, they're hiring you as is. But if they have a dress code, you do have to adhere to it. So you need to put that into perspective. What do you balance staying in your profession with getting well-rounded experience. How do you balance staying in your profession with getting well-rounded experience? To me, this whole platform has enhanced everything I do by opening my eyes to all different areas, all different cultures, all different religions, everything. To me, that's how I enhance myself. How do you educate playing a role 
How do you, did your education play a role in landing your first job or in making your successful as you moved on with your career? Well, this position, you have to have a specific education, a specific apprenticeship, a specific license. So it's everything, the education for this. Is there one skill you wish you had earlier in your career? What would it be? Humility. Is that a skill or a characteristic? Um, everybody, when they're 22 years old, thinks they're amazing, I think, and that they know everything. Just because you get a degree in your hand, you know this much about being a funeral director. This much. And after 20 years, I know maybe this much. This is an ever-evolving learning trade service that we are providing. You don't know it all. Tomorrow, a new body is going to come in that you have something on it that you've never seen before. So no, you don't know it all. So humility and humbleness to know that I am always learning. Learn it early in the career and don't forget that. Is there, uh, if someone wanted your job in 10 years, what would you tell them about getting an education? Um, uh, branch out. You know, we learned a wide variety of things. Hey, everybody. Um, always learning a wide variety of things to get into school. Never stop learning a wide variety of things. Stay up to date on new topics. Stay up to date on everything going on because having conversations with people we serve, you need to know a lot about a lot of areas. You are a little about a lot of areas. You need to be able to carry on conversations. You need to be educated about the world. So that's what I would say um, about selecting their first job. As I said, interview the person. What ways do you engage in continuous learning outside of work or school? To me, it's this. It's going to conferences, it's going to um, presentations, it's joining different groups that you can learn from. There's a lot of Facebook groups that do have some good information in it for embalmers and funeral directors you, you can bounce ideas off of. Yeah, you're going to get crap people who say crap things to you in those groups, but there's also good people and there's good information in them. How important is networking in your job or profession? I think it's really essential. And it's not just networking with fellow funeral directors. It's networking with all sorts of people because we are working with clergy and florists and cemeteries and sextants, and vault companies, and all these different areas. So networking with a hospice is crucial. Networking with clergy is crucial. So that type of networking is big. How can I start networking now? Join a Lions Club, join a Rotary Club, join something within a community to be connected if you have a funeral home in that community that you're working for. All right, student number two, here we go. Do you guys see what I mean? These are super generalized questions. So I don't know what kind of class these are for, but how did you happen to enter funeral service as a career? I worked in the funeral home when I was 16 because my mom worked there and here we are. What is your role in comforting the bereaved? The whole, everything we do is to comfort them. Everything from start to finish. We are comforting them by caring for their loved one. What do you like best and least about your profession? Depends on the day. Something I like today, I may not like tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I like dealing with people from all walks of life and learning from different people and learning different cultures and religions. So I guess that's the best, least about your profession that we have to charge money, obviously. Like that sucks. We don't love that we have to charge people money when they're at a sad, vulnerable stage. Who wants to do that? Um, but it's a business at the end of the day and you can't be there to serve other families if you don't have income coming. So what's the most difficult part of your job? Charging money. Um, talking business and talking numbers and really getting into people's really private financial situations. From your experience, how important is it for the family to view the body? Essential. Essential. Super important. How long after embalming does body begin to decay? There's no answer. Go watch my video on this question. There's absolutely no answer. There are dozens of of different things that impact how a body breaks down, when a body breaks down, whether they're embalmed or not. Embalming is a temporary, temporary preservation. 
So it is not meant to last forever. It is temporary for the services. As soon as that body is contained and exposed to moisture, that decomposition is going to go. So temporary. Remember that word. Um, what is the future of funeral industry? This business changes slowly, but is very progressive. So there is a lot of change coming in the next 10, 15 years within the business with all of the different disposition choices. We've got composting, um, alkaline hydrolysis. We've got green burial, which really is a big, vague term now, um, but a more natural version of burial. We've got just all sorts of different things that are coming about. And so who knows what's next, but it's always evolving. How do you view a funeral? What is its purpose? To me, the funeral is to reflect on the life of the person who has died for the family that is there. It is for them. It's not for the deceased. They're not here. It's not about them at all. What is happening? Is it good for the family? Is it something that will fulfill a need for them as they carry on in this life? That is what a funeral, a visitation, a gathering, that is what it's about. It's about the family meeting their needs, meeting their emotional, visceral things that they need. Um, so what do they need? Not what does the deceased need? What do they need? What advice would you give to a mortuary student striving to become a funeral director? If you have not shadowed at a funeral home, do not go to mortuary school. You know this much about being a mortician. If you've just watched videos and looked at stuff, you need to shadow a funeral director and see what really happens. You're not going around all day giving people warm and fuzzies and getting warm and fuzzies. There is a lot of paperwork, phone calls, logistics, things that you don't see because they're kind of boring and mundane. So you really need to see the full spectrum of what someone does. See what an actual schedule looks like. See what the inner workings of a funeral home are. Get in and shadow. Get a job at a funeral home. Work visitation. Work weekends. Take the, you know, work the evening phone shift. Work whatever. Get a position helping doing removals. Get some exposure within the industry before you dive into mortuary science school. It'll give you a great perspective. It's either going to enhance your interest or it's going to kill your interest. So... Um, but I think you really need to know the full spectrum before you dive in. Those are all the questions. Let's get to your guys' questions. I'm going to scroll back to the beginning. Oh, do funeral homes keep a picture of the deceased? Um, most don't, but some actually do. If they didn't, um, if it's like a cremation, they'll keep a picture of the deceased just to have one file. Most don't. Hello in Australia. I think that's so fun. Hello in Maine. Maine is so pretty. Oklahoma. I've never been there. No, I am a freelance funeral director, so I don't own my own funeral home. Brandon, how long does funeral homes keep records? Forever. Um, every funeral home I've ever been in has record, all the original records. Do you think I could start a business in Michigan being a funeral consultant to help people plan a person's service perfectly and find the best funeral home for them? I think it's a non-necessary position. Um, Josh, I don't think. I think it's trying to get in between a funeral director and the family, honestly. So I think that position is not necessary. And if families are looking to watch finances, why do you want to take more finances from them that could go towards having the type of services they want? That's my opinion on it. Um, yeah, there's some families who may want some help, but it's just like a hospice nurse stepping in and trying to find a funeral home for a family. You don't know what's best for the family. The family needs to feel out the funeral home and see if it's the right fit for them. You cannot base it on cost alone. You cannot base it on just location alone always. That family needs to interact and see if they feel good with it who is answering the phone and who they're speaking to and who they make a pre-need with and everything. It's not for you. It's for the family. So I think putting yourself in between is an unnecessary position. That's just my feeling. How do you remove a body when it's especially smelly? 
Uh, it depends where we're removing them from. If they're especially smelly, if they're an advanced decomp, they're going to be in a body bag coming from the medical examiner's office, more than likely. Oh, David just left that door by the dumpster, which means he left a hospital making a removal because the door to get in to go to the morgue is always by a dumpster. Do you still do removals as a freelancer? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Um, the one location that I'm at the most, they use a service for all, almost all their removals. So I don't go on removals very often for them. But if I'm at a smaller funeral home covering, yeah, I do go on them. I just lost where I was. Welcome, Susan, to the live. Were you nervous on your first day on the job? I don't remember, Robert. I mean, that was when I was 16. So I, not a clue. Not a clue. It was so long ago. I don't remember being nervous or not nervous. Oh, Damien, I did a service for a funeral home last summer and they called me last month, but I'm afraid to go back because of the killings in Philadelphia. I really want to get back in the business. No, I totally get that. There's so many killings going on and so much bad crap going on everywhere, though, I feel like. So, um, yeah, go with your gut. You've got to feel safe and you got to feel comfortable. Hello in St. Louis. I just love that I have a like a St. Louis group of people that watch me. It makes me so happy. <laughs> Um, I am in Michigan. Do you have to contact the florist and meet with them for funeral arrangements or can a funeral director do this for you? It depends on the funeral home. Some funeral homes won't get in the middle. They don't want to be the third party ordering something and then you show up and not like it. Some funeral homes also have florist books from local florists that they show at the funeral home and they just add it to the bill. Some will make you go to the, go to the florist and handle it all on your own. So it just depends on the funeral home. I prefer to remember my grandma and my dad standing upright, hugging me and smiling back at me as I said goodbye from a visit rather than laying in a coffin. Lori and I completely, that's just my personal opinion. So, um, and then from things I have seen at the funeral home and families that I have dealt with. Um, my mom died in 98 when I was 10 years old and I went on the funeral home. I said to see what they have for obituary, but I couldn't find her. Well, that's a long time ago for a funeral home. They may not have even had a website back then. How long was that? Uh, Mr. Bridges, I'm not asking. I don't know what you're asking about. Hey, Elizabeth in Kalamazoo. You're so close. I, I think it's fun when people are pretty close to me. Last drive. Good morning. Yeah, so I've been working on editing some of my stuff from my trip out to Pittsburgh Institute of Mortuary Science. I was there for three days when they had their advanced, their restoration three-day seminar um, class that all the students have to do. It's a lot of content, <laughs> um, so it's going to be a three-part series of videos on the clay heads they had to do, and I kept saying wax in the video, but hey, I can't redo it now, so there's a preface that says it's Carrie is wrong. She keeps saying wax when it is clay. And um, they smash a plaster of Paris skull and then put it back together. And then they have to do wax work and restoration. This time I do mean wax on a head that has different kinds of destruction to it. All fake heads, no real people used, um, but super fascinating and fun to see all these students do that kind of work. So been definitely um, editing on some of that got a new video series coming soon so that video to announce the series is going to be coming and still working on um tr planning to gear up in may for a new channel um kind of a branch off of me obviously and more of a personal little insight into the business but more just personal fun stuff trying to get the fun back in what i do with um my channels and stuff. And so doing a separate channel for that part of it. Is your new beau a funeral director too? No, he is not a funeral director. I'm from Michigan and want to move back. What county do you think would be the best to work in in this industry? Oh, it's there's jobs in almost every single county right now. There's so many jobs in Michigan. Um, so I would 
look for a job and move to the job. So you can start looking and um, yeah, there's so many jobs right now. When embalming thought the heart through the heart, when no, so Jane, you do the injection first and then the cavity works. So you're done using the heart and then you want to break the heart open to get any blood pulled through and out of it. So that's kind of how you do it. Oh, that weren't shady. Well, um, there's no real, yeah, there's no real county. I mean, it depends on if you want to be country or city or if you're going to go to Wayne County, um, it's going to be a little bit different. I would avoid the city if you don't want to be in the city. Wayne County is rough. Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office is having a lot of bad, 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 bad problems. Um, so, yeah. What's the possibility of an internship? There are so many internships available, like dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, but a lot of students don't want to move to the jobs. They just are expecting that there's a job where they grew up and where they want to go to. So that's the problem. This business, you have to move to the position. You can't just expect a position to be open wherever you want to be. There are so many jobs. You have to go to them, though. Is there such a thing as financial help assistance available to families who do not have the funds to have a funeral for a loved one? Such a great question because I have a video coming up on this a two minute in a couple weeks. Um, there's not, there's not much. Um, some states do have a little bit, but the family does have to also pay a good chunk to offset. So um, like in Michigan, you can, uh, families have to pay at least $1,000 usually for cremation. And then the, the state will pay about 300 and some. And you have to go complete all the paperwork, jump through all the hoops to get that 300. Yes, it's worth it to some families, but they still have to pay a chunk of money. So there's no free anything for anybody. Um, there's always a cost to something. Night, night, Belinda. I want funeral. Do you like you and Caitlin? Thank you. In your area, some funeral homes are better than others. So I just want to help match them up. But that's your opinion that they're better than others. Josh, that's the problem is what makes a funeral home better than another funeral home? I mean, that's personal perspective. Right now in my area, thinking of all the funeral homes, there's just differences between all of them. It doesn't make them better. But a family may want something over another or they may connect with the director more than someone at a different funeral home. I know families that have switched funeral homes because of different reasons. And so your opinion is not the opinion of the family you're matching with. If you're understanding, I'm not trying to downplay what you want to do, but I see a lot of problems with it. Like a lot of people, I know that some funeral directors like to have a drink and some have drinking issues. What happens when they go for a drink and get a call? They clearly shouldn't drive work. Well, they need to be responsible. Um, like I just edited a beer with the boys video that I did and we were all drinking and I say I'm on call and I'm like, crap, on call just means I'm taking the phones. I'm not leaving the house. So I'm like, okay, I don't want anybody to think I'm going out driving a hearse after having a couple of beers. So um, you know, drink everybody you hope drinks responsibly, you know, one or two drinks doesn't mean that you're not able to go drive a vehicle, um, if you're under the limit. So you just hope everyone acts responsibly when they're on call. Did you ever, oh, death ain't free. Exactly. Jamie, um, Jessica, like what? I don't know what you're asking. Like what? I live in Ohio. It's only one of two states in the union. The other being Minnesota requires a bachelor's degree. Why is that? I'm not sure, Mark. Every I My biggest wish is that literally every state had the same laws when it came to licensure and laws within the state because it is really hard to um, reciprocate to another state with your license and to go somewhere else if you don't have the right license and stuff. So, yeah, I wish that it was. I've been working on my will. Some of my family members are mad because I don't want a service. 
I told, I told them I don't want them to cry over my body and deal with the fake friends. Chantel, though, it's about them. What do they need? You're gone. Don't worry. You're gone. What do they need? If they need to gather and they need people surrounding them and they need support, they're going to cry whether you get together or not because they're going to miss you. That's the price of love is sadness. So let them do what they need to in that sadness. You can't control whether they cry or not. You can't control all of that. Let them do what they need to do. Did you ever have to ask visitors, leave your funeral home because of bad behavior? Yeah, some people drunk, um, some people starting things. Most would plan on it to drink on a night, not on call. Not, not everyone would. Have you heard stories? Well, I do know people who have embalmed after they've had several drinks or whatever. Like one funeral home is terrible at embalming, but find it memorials. When a family chooses if viewing at that funeral home, they look terrible and it hurts the family. I want to help prevent that. But you don't know who embalmed that time. It could have been a trade embalmer. It could have been one of several people on staff. And you don't know what they started with. You don't know that it's a bad embalming. That's the problem is if you see, unless you go to a hundred funerals and see a hundred bodies at that funeral home every year, you don't know that that is their standard. You have to know what they started with to know what they're presenting and to know if it's a bad embalming. It doesn't mean it's a bad embalming. That's the problem is that that's everybody's go-to is, oh, it's a bad embalming because the person looked bad. They may look freaking amazing compared to how they looked when they were received. So you don't know what they started with to be able to judge if it's a bad embalming. How long do funeral homes keep unclaimed bodies? Um, usually if they're unclaimed, they start at the medical examiner's office. So it's not often, well, I won't say not often, but once they get to the funeral home and if they're there for a few days and they can't get a hold of anybody, then they may call the medical examiner and get somebody involved. Tom, so in New York City, HRA will pay up to $1,700 on a funeral of no more than $3,400. But how much does the family have to pay with that? I know it's annoying when others speak for the family. I want to partner with both parties, the funeral home and the family. I don't, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, Josh. Um, but I can see where it's a bad thing. Because you put the family almost on defense where the funeral director needs to make a relationship with the family. And if you're trying to wedge in between that, you're trying to just stop what we do as a profession and what we want to do with the family. So you're not allowing us to do our job. And so if someone gets between me doing my job, I'm going to get defensive and I'm going to get upset because I am there to serve the family. I'm not there to work with you who's working with the family. Like it's just getting in between what I'm trying to do for the family. We're not able to give them a good customer experience. We're not able to connect with them. We're not able to do what we want to do at the root of our core. What happens if no one claims a body? The state takes care of them. Sometimes it ends in cremation, sometimes burial, depending on the state or the county. When my mom was dying from cancer, she wanted everyone to visit her while she was alive and have a direct cremation when she passed. Plumber guy, did you guys get together at all or do like a family dinner or anything afterwards? And am I remembering her name was Kathleen? Am I remembering that right? Hey, Steve. Hi, Tara. I had a family member die this past December. His cremation was $4,000. Cremation is getting more expensive. Was that a direct cremation? No urn, no cemetery included. Just pick up, meet the family, paperwork, cremate, and give back. So that is the thing, is that if they included the cemetery portion, people don't understand that the cemetery could be $2,500, and that's on the funeral home's bill. So that fluctuates a funeral home's bill greatly because of all the cash advance items. 
If a family wants to run an $800 obituary and they're like, wow, my bill from the funeral home was, you know, exorbitant, but you chose all those cash advances. They're not funeral home charges. They're outside the funeral home. They don't control those. The family picks those. So that skews numbers when you're looking at funeral numbers because the funeral home doesn't control a lot of what a family picks. D, I like your answer. Do you have an opinion on organizations that offer cremation services at an affordable price like the Neptune Society? Um, so th any, there's a lot of direct cremation focused businesses. And the reason they can have such lower numbers is because they don't have facilities for full traditional services. So their overhead is much less which allows them to have those low prices. I think it's great if that meets a family's need, needs. If you don't need follow-up after, if you don't want to see the person, if you just want a simple cremation, get some death certificates, move on. That is great. If you want anybody to help you with anything beyond, don't use those kind of services. They're there to do the basics. With a lot of things, you get what you pay for it's going to be reflected in the service because they're not hmm, a lot of those businesses that are super low price are going to charge you for every little thing above and beyond that bare minimum basic. So remember that um, Neptune society is one that yeah is over and, and pops up. I don't have anything bad to say because I don't have a lot of interaction with them. Um, I know some that are across the country that you call them. It's not a funeral director who runs it. The price is stupid low. And that person then has to find a funeral home to facilitate the cremation at that price. And funeral homes are not doing it. And so then you have a family who doesn't know where their their loved one is. They have no idea what funeral home has their loved one. They have no idea what's going on. There could be a funeral home six hours away came and picked up their loved one and they have no clue. So some of those do a review run on them, do a better business bureau, Google them, look into them. It, things can be, you know, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Bye, Kelly. Thanks. Are funeral homes allowed to charge less for an item on their general price list? They can. Um, a general price list is there to try to, you know, put the put a level playing field for everybody because then everybody shows their prices up front. Here they are. They're open and honest. But you can always give. Um, a discount. You can do a veteran's discount. You can do whatever kind of discount. You just have to write and show why you're giving that discount. That's the only thing. Um, yeah. Josh is saying, I'm a youth pastor and help assist with funerals often. I've never seen a good embalming where the reaction is, oh, wow, they look beautiful from the big funeral home in Saginaw. But other funeral homes are great. No, and that's, I mean, that's honest, Josh, when you're around. And I'm not, I'm not saying what you're saying isn't valid. Um, we work with a lot of pastors, though, who um, get difficult because they put themselves in the middle and try and um, usurp the funeral director. And don't allow us to help the family um, and creates a really bad situation. But everybody has a part within the process. And if everybody can stay in their lane and do their part, it serves the family better. It's when the hospice nurses try to tell the family what funeral home to use, or the pastors try to come to the arrangement and take it over, or you know, all these things. Like if everybody does their part and does it well everything goes smoothly. And that's what we want at the end is a smooth process for the family during the whole thing. Each person can help in the other areas, but when they're trying to control the other areas and trying to be overly helpful, the over helpers 
which I have them too often where people come in, they think they're trying to protect the family and be over helpful. It just turns into a mess and the family's not well served by the funeral home. We do a direct cremation with urn for 1700. Deceased must have no money to get the 1700. Thanks, Josh, for what you do as well. I'm not trying to be combative. I'm just a very direct person. If you if you know me but at all, um, I'm very direct. I just I know there's a few people who are trying to do the funeral consultant thing, and I don't know if it'll ever catch on. Because people are so money conscious to hire another person in the middle, I don't know they would, they would do that. I don't know if it would be financially beneficial to you to be in that position and if you would get enough in the end or if, like I had said, you were taking from what they could be doing for the family member. I don't know. Um, it'd be an interesting thing to like play out with 10 families and see what happened. Um, Paul, I am going to object to your comments. Donate your body to a school. That's free. It is not free. Actually, always. You have to live within so many miles of the school and you have to be accepted into the donation program. So if you live outside of the parameters, which is usually like 20 to 30 miles, you have to get a funeral home and you have to pay them. And it's usually about the price of a direct cremation. So there is a cost and you have to be accepted into the program. Some require a pre-acceptance and some will decline you at the time of death because of your body condition. So not the case. Well, thank you India on streak for being consistent. Tell me I look beautiful. Hey Drew, hey Katie. Um, what causes the body to puff up during the embalming process with tissue gas? Because this be prevented. So tissue gas is a very distinct thing. It doesn't, it's not always what makes the body puff up. Um, so, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean they're going to puff up. Tissue gas is often just like blisters all over the body. It doesn't mean the body puffs up. Um, so tissue gas is going to happen if it's going to happen. Once you see signs of it, you can attack it. Um, but you may involve a body, look perfect, come back an hour later, and bam, all hell's broke loose because tissue gas is horrible. Um, you attack the brain at that point. You try to block off areas of the body. If, if you see it and it started prior to embalming, you can channel, you can attack it. Um, you can get, do really strong fluid. So there are ways to attack it if you see it prior or to go back in and try to halt it at the state it's in, because it can take a normal body and turn it completely decomposed in a very short period of time. Thank you, Palmer guy for sharing the story. Um, yeah, so Plumber Guy, everyone in the chat knows, so everyone knows, his mom was 64 when she passed. She watched me for a while before she passed. Three days before she passed, she told us what she wanted based on watching Carrie. So it's pretty powerful, and we've talked, and um, yeah, that's why I do what I do. Even if it just helps one person and helps one person be comfortable with something, make decisions for themselves, feel empowered, go into arrangements with good knowledge. That's all that matters. Can I ask about a cremation I never heard of before, I, but I've seen it on YouTube and I understand. How do you cremate with wood? So you're talking like a funeral pyre, like they do in India and stuff, Trish? Is that what you're talking about? When you donate your body, you don't usually get to choose where you go or for what research. Then your family still has to figure out what to do with you when they're done experimenting on your body. Maria, you're correct in some of that. Um, some schools just keep you at the school and you're there for a short period of time while a medical student uses you. But there's such a misconception that people think, oh, I have breast cancer. So when I die, I'm going to donate my body because they're going to want to study my breast cancer. Only if there is a specific breast cancer study going on right then will that affect anything. Otherwise, they don't, they're not going to just study your body and put that into a database. That's not how it works, unfortunately. 
And yes, some schools farm out to trajectory practice, um, but human body, crash test dummies, all sorts of things. So it's all in the paperwork that's signed, but a lot of people don't realize what they're signing. Um, so that is a valid point. And then after the end of the period, when they cremate the person, they can send them back to the family if that's what they choose, or they can be buried in the mass memorial service done usually once a year by a medical school. You can usually find them bitch where is yeah, Drew, exactly. Our filtered photos making it hard to serve families of younger people. Just having photos that look nothing like the deceased. Not really, because there's usually a picture of people that's normal. Yeah, Josh, I had a pitch I had a pastor who only referred to me as the twit. Honestly. <laughs> he was a something. Um, yes, he was. And I did nothing. Um, I think it all started with him because the person died Saturday night and we called the family Sunday morning and asked if they wanted to come in that morning to make arrangements. And it's a church service morning. Well, most families, when they've just had a, a loss that night, are not getting up and going to church. So it's standard protocol. We invite the family in to make arrangements if they'd like. Pastor didn't like that. And then I think his name was spelled wrong. Uh, from our funeral home previously on something. He had a really funky name to spell and it, we had inverted two letters or something. And so that kind of came back to play. So he called me a twit like every time I worked with him. It was terrible. Um, but yeah, we've had some bad pastors. I have a lot of really great pastors. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it is some of those pastors show up to arrangements and kind of insert themselves into the process. I had a family, I had a, this old, old lady. She was like 95. And it was a pastor who really likes to be at the arrangement so he can control things. He was out of town. So he called ahead and he said, hey, you can just put me on speakerphone when the family comes in. I was like, um, okay. So I, the family got there and they sat down and she goes, hell no, we're putting him on speakerphone. He doesn't need to be part of this. We'll let him know when we make decisions. And I was like, you go lady. It was just so cute. I think because she's this cute little old lady and she got some spunk in her and she wasn't going to have this pastor inserting himself. So yeah, I've got a lot of good pastor stories, but I have had more good interactions with pastors than not. So don't get me wrong on that though. <sighs> what? Last ride. I was at the airport the other day doing a ship out. The guy at the airlines following you. Like he follows me on YouTube. What airport? That's so cute. Have I ever had a case with gangrene? Yeah, too many, um, Daniel. And it's stinky and it's gross. Um, it's just old, dead, necrotic tissue stuff. And just, yeah, it's bad. Do you have to legally be embalmed if you're at being cremated? You don't ever have to legally be embalmed. Embalming is not a law anywhere. You may get in a state that there is a law that within a certain period, you have to be buried, cremated, embalmed, or in a certain specific type of cold storage. But embalming is not a law anywhere. So, mic drop. Um... Oh, Josh, that's not a reflection on God. That's people. That's not God at all. So my God is, he is a good person. He is a good being. And he is, he is, that is not God in that person. So nope, don't, don't you worry. What is the history viewings are called wakes? My son was curious because the person is dead because people would stay awake and sit up with them. So they would be up all night and sit woken with the person. Oh, yes. I've watched Ozarks in the past and will laugh to the cremation of the victims. However, what safeguards are in place so that a person who works in the funeral industry couldn't dispose of someone? It's a great question. Um, we just have to believe in legality and in people doing the right thing. Because, yeah, you could super easily dispose of somebody if you needed to. Um, make somebody go away. So you could bury them in a casket with somebody else. You could bury them 
or you could cremate them. I, it, yes, it is all legit, but it's, yeah, super naughty. My friend that died was 96. He wasn't embalmed, but he did. Did he start to rot right away? Yep, he was probably decomposing before he died. Most people, when they're of a certain age, are decomposing before they actually die even. What's the difference in a wake and a repass? Is that what you're asking, a repass? So a repass is like a luncheon. That's where you eat food after a funeral. Did I ever finish my state series? I think I was two states short. Um, I I'm trying to think what states. Maybe like Delaware or something and Alaska or... Rhode Island in the way I can't remember which states. I know Alaska was one of them. And then I just stopped because I didn't want to circle back so far after. But I think I was two states short of getting an interview from every state. I think that's the coolest. You in Portland, Oregon, who work at the airport. Hello to you. I love like I, when I was at PIMS um, at that restorative art thing, the one student was telling me how much her stepmom loves me. And so we gave her shout outs in my live videos. I sent her a mug after just saying, Hey, you know, thank you. Um, actually it's still here in a box. So sh sorry, Karen, that's supposed to be a surprise. Um, so I just love, I love, like, it's so humbling that people actually watch my stuff. <laughs> I know you guys are like, Oh, come on. But yeah, it's just always still. Yeah. Yes, Drew. Crooked Love funeral directors will tell families their loved one has to be embalmed. It is naughty. However, a funeral home may require that. It doesn't mean it's a law, but a funeral home may require embalming for public viewing. Or if they're going to hold the body for an extended period of time, they may require it. Um, who, nobody wants a stinky, rotting body around for weeks. So that's it may be required for those reasons. All right. One last question, I think. How is your tattoo healing? Um, It's good. So this was my most recent tattoo. I posted pictures. Um, Yeah, this one's doing good. So it is. I'm ready for another. It's addicting, guys. It really is. But it's healing up good. So it's funny, though, because when I talk in videos, I see it. Oh, I also got one over here, too, for my girls. Um, I'm going to add more to that one, I think. It's a little too plain for me, but I now see the, the tattoos and I think, oh, what do people think of them? So, um, I have four tattoos. Uh, my social media helper, Amanda had posted, it was only my second, but it was my fourth actually. So they're all small and I'm, you know, not too big. Jennifer, what was rotting before he died? So people often, parts of them are dying or dead before the rest of them dies. And so I've gotten somebody who had died an hour before, their whole abdomen was green, which is called decomposition. That is the first stage. And if they're green, they are going south quick. And that happens a lot with people. So of the arrow. So it, it's the further with an arrow, the further you pull it down, the farther it's going to shoot. So anything that holds you back, it just means the farther is going to propel you later. So I just liked it. Been a long last two years have been kind of a fight to establish myself and I'm kind of getting my own two feet. I got a divorce last year and stuff. So it's been a process and just feeling like going into my next stage. So, all right, I'm cutting off. I've gone a long time today, 49 minutes, but thank you guys for joining me. Watch for new videos coming. There's a contest that is posting today at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. It's just a funny contest. Um, I love giving stuff away and it was challenging. Um, it was very challenging for me trying to do this. So I wanted to put the challenge on you guys as well. So check that out at two o'clock and watch for more new videos. Thanks guys. Click subscribe if you don't subscribe.